Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian, I am here today at the Rock Island Auction Company, taking a look at some of the guns that they're going to be selling in their upcoming uh, September of 2016 Premier Auction. And we have a very cool prototype Swiss rifle here. Now this is an AK-44, has nothing to do with uh, the AK Kalashnikov, that's just uh, an automatic carbine designation from 1944. Uh, this was produced by the WF Bern factory, Waffenfabrik Bern, uh, one of the two major uh, factories in Switzerland that made just a whole plethora of weird semi-auto rifles from, boy, the 1920s all the way through the 1950s. Uh, the, the other one, of course, being SIG. Now, this one is interesting in that it is almost a complete perfect copy of the Russian SVT Tokarev rifle, the SVT-40. Uh, clearly, the Swiss got their hands on a couple of those and thought, well, you know, that's an interesting system. The Russians are uh, mass producing them. The Russians made hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of Tokarev rifles. And uh, apparently it was enough for the Swiss to think that maybe they wanted to give that a try as well. So, uh, in 1944, they manufactured actually a surprising variety of these guns, quite a few of them. Now, this particular one has a telescopic sight on it. This is the exact same well, I shouldn't say exact same. This appears to be the very same model um, of sight that was on the Swiss 1942 and 1943 bolt-action sniper rifles. Those are the K3142 and K3143. Uh, it has this folding uh, front lens there, so when you're not using it, you can fold it down out of the way. When you are using it, you fold it up. Um, it is somewhere between probably a one and a half and a two and a half power scope. So quite low magnification, it's offset to the side so it doesn't uh, rise up over the top of the rifle at all. Uh, very light, very really kind of inconspicuous. Um, this particular AK-44 has one of those scopes. Now they made a bunch of other versions. Some versions of the AK-44 don't have a scope at all. Some of them have a rail on the side here to accept a uh, German ZF-4 scope or a Swiss copy thereof. There are a number of different fore-end configurations for these rifles. This one, of course, is patterned very much off the SVT-40, but they also had some that had the same basic muzzle as a Swiss K31. Uh, they had at least one version that had the sort of uh, sawtooth muzzle break from a German FG-42, or not the exact one, but a copy thereof. Uh, they really tried a wide variety of versions of this rifle. So, uh, I wanted to take a look at this. We'll take it apart and check out the insides. And I figured since it is a copy of the Tokarev, I'd bring out my spare comparison Tokarev, which I always keep lying around just in case. So we can uh, compare and take a look and see just how close of a copy it really is. All right, so the top view here really gives you an idea of the, the similarity. Um, we have the Tokarev here. Slightly different shape to the bolt handle. You know, the, the Swiss rifle has a Swiss rear sight as opposed to an exact copy of the Russian rear sight. But clearly we have a sheet metal uh, receiver cover. We have a bolt. Well, this is actually the bolt carrier with a tilting bolt inside. Same exact function there. Stripper clip guide on the top of this receiver cover. Now on the Russian one, you can see that it's kind of inletted right here. That's to fit a 762 by 54 rim stripper clip. The Swiss rifle uh, has a six round magazine and it has this open square guide because it uses the same stripper clip as the K31, which, uh, well, it's a big, actually reinforced cardboard clip that would fit in this shape of um, slot. So the Swiss rifle here is in 7.5 Swiss, which was the standard Swiss caliber at the time. The only real difference here is the addition of this telescopic sight on the Swiss rifle. Get the same sort of idea up here at the front. Uh, we have this metal perforated dust cover. Uh, we actually have the same basic wooden handguard as well with perforations, four on each. The Swiss left off the cleaning rod, uh, but they still have a bayonet lug. This is actually more or less a copy of the early SVT muzzle brake. This particular SVT has been refurbished and it has the later pattern of brake, but the early ones had a multi-slot brake just like that. So even little details, gas adjustment, that sort of thing. Even down to the small details, the Swiss AK-44 is a very close copy of the Tokarev. Couple of quick features here to point out, and these are all duplicated on the SVT. The magazine catch can actually fold back and act as a lock in this position. You can't, uh, can't remove the magazine, so to remove it you fold this down and then the magazine comes out. 
This was a six round magazine in this particular gun. Um, amongst all the different variations, uh, they did make uh, magazines of 24 rounds as well, and probably some in between. They may have had a, I, I suspect they probably tried some 12s, maybe some 18s. Of course, doing that in increments of six because the standard Swiss Charger clip held six rounds. Now, the safety on this rifle is patterned right after the Tokarev. It's this tab, which simply folds back, well, folds down behind the trigger, and all that has to do is prevent the trigger from moving backwards. Can't move the trigger backwards, rifle can't fire. So that's the safe position, that's the fire position. On the Tokarev rifles, the full auto Tokarevs had a third full auto position flipped over to the other side, and I believe there, there were at least, at least one AK-44 that was made as a full auto or select fire rifle as well. This one, of course, is just semi. So as on the 1942 and 43 uh, Swiss K-31 snipers, the, there is a BDC built into the scope, and it takes the form of a tangent sight, just like your iron sights. So to adjust the reticle for different ranges, you simply take this, slide it, and what that does is move this cam up and down, which adjusts the position of your reticle, which by the way is a chevron with two horizontal lines. It adjusts the position of that reticle inside uh, the field of view. Now, unfortunately, this one, the cam is broken in there somehow, so it doesn't actually adjust, but that's how it was supposed to work. One last interesting little feature, this, which is really stiff, I think it's full of grease, I can't move it on this one, but this is actually, I'll show you on the Tokarev, this opens up and there's a hole in the back of the receiver here, which once you pull out the bolt allows you to actually run a cleaning rod in from the back, which is a better way to clean it than from the muzzle. That's also copied directly from the Tokarev. So here's that feature on the Tokarev. This is just a cover port and you snap it open 90 degrees and now you've got cleaning access through the back of the receiver. Now, like the Tokarev, disassembly of this guy is kind of a pain. What we have to do is actually push the cover plate all the way forward. It holds the recoil spring, so we pull it forward and then we can tip it up out of the gun, let it out gently, which is a little tricky to do. That comes all the way forward to there. And then tilt it up and out. Yep. There we go. All right, so now we've got the cover plate off. Now, in another kind of tricky operation, this recoil spring is designed so that it won't actually, you can't just pull it off to the side and out. What I have to do is pull this back until I get to the front of the guide rod. Whoop. Or that. We'll just go with that. Alright, now that I've got the recoil spring and the dust cover off, now the bolt comes all the way back to here, pivots up right there, and then comes out. The reason for all this pivoting is that there are two very small rails cut on the inside of the receiver here, right down in there. And there's an open slot right here so that pieces can drop in and out. All right, and there is the field stripped uh, AK-44. Basically just a big open flat receiver. Our locking lug is right here. This operates like the SVT with a tilting bolt. So here's the bolt and the bolt carrier. This is in the unlocked position. When the carrier goes all the way forward, this angled surface pushes the bolt down. When the bolt goes down, this little shiny rectangular section locks in against a lug in the bottom of the receiver, and that's what prevents the bolt from opening. Then, when the gun cycles, we have a gas piston at the top, which comes back, hits this spot right here, so the bolt's in position, the carrier comes back, and then these two angled surfaces contact, that pulls the bolt up out of its uh, locking lug, and then the whole thing can travel backwards. To access the gas system of the rifle, the first thing we have to do is take off the front barrel band, which I've already started it. There's a little spring here. That one's really tight, so there we go. This comes off the front. Now, the next step is supposed to be that we take this lever, fold it up, or rotate it up, and that unlocks uh, the metal portion of the handguard. This lever is really stiff. I, I don't want to break it. I'm going to leave it alone. Instead, I just slid the metal handguard forward just enough that the rear handguard locking tab comes out of its projection, and then 
we can just pull this out. So the way this works is there's a gas port in the barrel here, which has a little fixed uh, piston head. And then we have this long piston right here. And you can see when I push it back, it comes out right there. That impacts the very front of the bolt carrier right there. And that's what forces it to go backwards. So I have now taken apart my backup comparison Tokarev. These are the actual Russian Tokarev parts. These are the Swiss parts. And you can clearly see that this is an exact copy. So, not interchangeable. Obviously, they're two different calibers and they're made by two different factories, but the mechanism is completely the same. And here are the two receivers, same thing. You can see the hammer locations are exactly the same, hammer mechanism's the same, the magazine catch is the same. It's all, the Swiss added a little bit of shroud over the front uh, where the, the bolt head goes in. The Soviets left it a little bit more open. That's pretty much the extent of the difference here. So we have a little bit uh, more difference here, but still pretty minuscule. Now the Swiss moved this, uh, the gas port, the gas piston spring here. The Russians have it actually under the sight. But obviously they both work the same way. Now we can look at the front of the Russian one here and, and see how the Swiss one actually works. What's going on is that when gas comes out, it pushes this whole assembly. However, when you need to take the rifle apart, these two pieces are actually separate. So you can pull this out for disassembly. But that doesn't cause it to disassemble under normal use because normally these two are pushing against each other. So the Swiss rifle is built the same way, it's just hidden under that handguard. So ultimately, this production, along with all of the other uh, semi-auto prototype production at Bern and also at SIG really didn't go anywhere for quite some time to come. Uh, ultimately, the, the Swiss would adopt the PE-57, also known as the SIG AMT, uh, and that would be the, the semi-auto replacement for their long line of Schmidt-Rubin straight pole rifles. Well, thank you for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. This is an extremely rare gun, uh, for about as close to one of a kind as you can get. So hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Uh, neat look into another bit of the world of uh, World War II Swiss rifle experimentation. So if this looks like uh, the sort of thing that you'd really like to own yourself, well, check out the description text below. A link there will take you to Rock Island's catalog page on the rifle where you can read their description and see their more detailed photos. And if you're interested, you can place a bid online or come up here to the auction house to participate uh, live in person. Thanks for watching.